Eric, you said that you don't understand our work on originalism, and I think that is correct. <laughs> uh, but not for lack of trying. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll try. So our view is that originalism is a method rather than a collection of results. And that, so what makes it a decision or an argument originalist is whether or not it applies the method, uh, whether or not it calls for the right criteria of evaluation, even though it might be wrong. So as we wrote in a piece that I think you've read because you've responded to it, uh, but not, don't mention it in your book. Uh, you know, we've noted many judicial opinions that make originalist arguments. Obergefell makes originalist arguments. Brown makes originalist arguments. Blaisdell makes originalist arguments. That doesn't make those cases right as a matter of originalism, because those who disagree with the cases make originalist arguments too, and it's unlikely that both sides are right. So we think originalist arguments are ubiquitous, and that many of the arguments are mistaken. Uh, and the fact that you make an originalist argument doesn't mean that you are correct any more than the fact that you wave around a yardstick proves that you're tall. Now, some people who wave yardsticks are, in fact, tall, like Shaq, uh, but many, many are not. Um, I, I guess by analogy, I'd say, you know, uh, two lawyers disagree, right? And in most of these cases, one of the lawyers can be wrong. They lose the case per time, and I have to explain why. They, they don't stop being a lawyer just because they got the law wrong. We wouldn't say that person was not a lawyer, they weren't doing law, because in, in this particular case, their, their, their position lost. They both held up ways of judging which was right or wrong, and then sometimes the, the, you know, the lawyer gets the law wrong, and sometimes he gets it right. So what it means to be an originalist and what differentiates originalism from living constitutionalism is whether or not your criteria ultimately trace back to founding era law or reconstruction era law. Uh, which means you're hostage to the original law and history. So, so I think I if it's genuinely true that investigation into what kind of deference was there in the state courts in 1800 determines how deferential we should be, then you are an originalist. And you know, there's been papers at this conference before and will be more in the future about how much deference is due. But the key thing is that that's what's driving your, your deference rather than like a normative view that you don't care what the amount of legal deference was uh, and you just want it, well, you just want it anyway. Uh, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. And we try to be explicit about that by even saying some of these very cases that make originalist arguments are wrong. And we have a hit list, including Blaisdell and Wickard and Prince and Lujan and many more, uh, that we don't think are right. So you could ask, are they, are they originalist? Are they good originalist cases in the sense that they're consistent with the original meaning? No. But they're originalist cases in the sense that they make originalist arguments because originalism is fundamental to our law. Uh, one might even say it is our law. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Eric, I think that I do understand why, what's your list, Will and Steve and Randy and Mike and Jack uh, uh, call themselves originalists. I want to know why you call yourself an originalist, or what's in it for you, right? <laughs> Um, be, be, because it's true, a lot of people think of you as a critic of originalism. A lot of you think of you as a quite pronounced critic of originalism. Um, and, uh, but you are making the assertion that you are in fact the real originalist. Um, and I hear you saying to all these other people, what's in it for them to say that they're originalists? It doesn't look like it. But you have to answer the same question, right? Why, what's in it for you to describe yourself as an originalist? Um, okay, uh, first of all, um, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, for once, I'm not the bad guy at this conference, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> So I agree with a lot of what you say in this book, obviously, um, though I don't share your fantasy world. Um, and, and maybe I don't share your understanding of the notion of originalism as faith. Um, your take is that originalism is a means of maintaining faith in the rule of law and in the institution of judicial review and that that faith is misplaced. I, I want to suggest maybe a somewhat different connection between originalism and faith that has always occurred to me and, and get your thoughts on that. So it starts with the observation that there is a substantial overlap in this country between persons who are identify as originalist and, and persons who are deeply religious, who have religious faith. Perhaps the explanation for that is just political. Both religiosity and originalism are associated with political conservatism, and so it makes sense that people would 
who are politically conservative would check both those boxes. But I think there's another explanation for the correlation between religiosity and originalism, and that it is that they both rely on faith. In both cases, religion and originalism, there is a belief in metaphysical right and wrong answers to fundamental questions, and a faith that we here on Earth, perhaps with divine assistance, can determine the, the answers, the correct answers to those big questions. So an agnostic might say, look, I don't know whether there is a God or not. I don't know whether there is an afterlife or not. There's no way that I could know that. Of course, a person of faith w would not say that. Similarly, a non-originalist might say something along the lines of, I think this case could reasonably go either way, but I'm inclined to think that the petitioner has the better of the argument there, here. Therefore, I, I disagree with your argument. But an originalist might be more likely to say, the Constitution means X, not Y. The correct answer in this case is the petitioner wins and respondent loses. Not I disagree with your argument, but rather your argument is wrong. So Bobidian modalities are a form of constitutional agnosticism, both as to the proper method of interpretation and as to the proper answer to any particular constitutional question. Originalism is a form of constitutional faith, a deep abiding belief that there is one correct method of interpretation and that it produces correct answers to difficult cases. A belief in metaphysical truth, a belief in right and wrong. As with God, so too with law, faith. Now, your earlier chapters in this book note that much of the new originalism is inconsistent with that because it admits of the indeterminacy of constitutional language. It admits of a substantial construction zone. And maybe that's part of what has led Steve Smith to suggest that originalism has lost its soul. But yet, many originalists continue to make the leap of faith. I don't think one can logically accept the moves of the new originalism and still think of constitutional interpretation as producing determinate right and wrong answers to contentious questions. I think maybe Jack made a version of that point this morning. I don't think it's logical to believe both in the new originalism and in the notion of constitutional determinacy. But then maybe logic isn't really the heart of it because that's the thing about faith. Thanks, those are great. Those are great. Um questions. I, I'll start with Richard because I think it's the most important for me. Um, I think of myself as an, as an originalist, as an instrumental way kind of to get to deference, but I also think that's what drove Berger and Bork and Gralia. Um, I, 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 I think that um, I like on number 78, and I think Hamilton was right, and I think judges shouldn't strike down laws unless there is an irreconcilable variance with something, and what that something is has to be one of two things. Text, which is almost never going to happen, but could, um, or you know what is really universally shared understandings about what the text was supposed to do. And under my theory, very, uh, almost all Supreme Court doctrines wrong. I mean, I think New York Times versus Sullivan is probably wrong. Um, I think Brown is right. I think Obergefell is right textually, probably. Um, but you know, I, I'll give it away. I mean, you know, Reynolds, uh, Reynolds is wrong. I mean, I, you know, so so my, that's my dream world, and that and that and that's the world I think Berger and Gralia wanted. And no one ever argued that they weren't originalists. I mean, they were. Now we have different kinds of originalists. But but what's in it for me, and what was in it for them. Is to now it just so happens that my perspective on deference is consistent with a lot of 18th century cases. So uh, John McGinnis looks at those same cases and says eh, it's probably moderate deference. Um, Dean Trainer says it was almost no deference for cases involving judges and juries, almost total deference for other cases. I, I think the answer is they expected almost total deference, except for judicial power cases, procedure cases. Um, that's not why, but that I'm lying, that's not why I'm an originalist though. I, that, that's, that's just, what I'm saying is consistent with that. My, my, my values drive my deference. I don't want the court doing a lot. So that's, that's what I get out of it. Um, so I don't, I mean, Will, uh, Steve and I had a lunch, a terrible Chinese restaurant he picked out, um, and had a long talk about this. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't, I, I've tried really hard because I wrote an article in Cornell and I've talked to people about it. Um, uh, I talked about at the Chicago Loyola Conference with Judd a few years ago. Um, I've really tried to figure this out. 
Judge Posner and I have talked about it privately a hundred times because you're his GRA at some point and he likes you a lot. And he doesn't understand what you're saying and neither do I. The rejection of originalism in Brown or Obergefell. I don't, don't feed me spam is a statement about spam, but it's a statement that rejects spam. I don't want it, don't give it to me. And Brown says, we don't want your, we, we've looked at it, and we don't want your history. We're deciding this on something else. Kennedy says, I am not bound. Why are people shaking their heads about this? I'm sorry, what? That's not what Brown said. Brown said we can't turn back, we can't turn back, we can't turn back the clock. To, but, but hold on, but. There's a case for I don't see how you can read Justice Kennedy's, Justice Kennedy's view of the 14th Amendment is it allows me to evolve over time and change things. It's, it's the, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment was don't use originalism. And if that's what originalism is, I don't know how it's different from non-originalism. I just don't get it, I've really tried. I, Steve and I came to a little bit of a common ground at lunch when I said, I agree that originalism is part of our law. I mean, only an idiot would deny that. I mean, I, I think originalism is part of our law. It's part of what you do, it's part of what the judges do, uh, it's part of what my judges did that I clerked for, it's part of our law. It does not and never has driven results at the Supreme Court. And to the extent we're talking about today, your originalism would drive different results than your originalism, which would drive different results than your originalism, and not because you think the history yields different conclusions. We, we can all, that's fine. Originalists can say, I think history means X, and you think history means Y. The difference between Mike Rappaport and John McGinnis and you guys is not what history shows, it's how to use it. And it's a very big difference. Um, Tom, uh, first of all, uh, Mike, claims about this go to the Supreme Court, not the rule of law generally. So I want, I'm, not, I am not operating at that philosophical level. I'm just not. Um, so I've, I've had objections to the word faith from a lot of different people. Cambridge likes it a lot, so I'm probably gonna go with it. But um, <laughs> I've, I've had objections. Um, a, very, a friend of mine who's deeply orthodox Jewish person, religious person, um, was upset by the title. He agrees with the whole book, but is upset by the title, which is ironic in certain ways, I think. Um, but what I mean by faith, and I explain this at the end, is it's still a reaction to the realist critique at every level. That's what it is. Because Erwin Chemerinsky and Posner and myself, and I think a lot of other people, and virtually every smart, informed non-lawyer I meet, agree that when we're talking about the Supreme Court of the United States, we're talking about the aggregate of their preferences writ large. Um, and, and the last thing I want to say for the next round is I actually meant to say this earlier and it would have cle cleared up a lot. I am, I think, the biggest uh, Scalia Thomas critic in the country. I wrote a piece in Wake Forest saying Justice Thomas is guilty of either bad faith or confusion. Um, I have written blog post after blog post and article after article about how Scalia and Thomas don't vote in an originalist fashion. I am a Scalia Thomas critic. I don't think I'm an originalist critic, and those are two different things. Um, so if I could just jump, jump briefly, I mean, to, to say, you're, I mean, I, I think we can be excused for reading your you know, the excerpt from your book and saying you were original. So, I mean, here's the last paragraph of your, your book. Supreme Court justices should either stop striking down state and federal laws unless the evidence of unconstitutionality is compelling, or they should openly admit that it is their values writ large that make the difference. You know, so, and you've said a bunch of times, well, that, you know, Bayerian deference is a non-starter, so you're encouraging, you're giving an attaboy to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court when they use the term constitution to refer to something other than the original sense expressed by the text. And that is, you're, you're, I mean, if you give an attaboy to the Supreme Court when they use the constitution in that way, that is just not originalism. That's the non-originalism. That's why everybody thinks you're not original, because well, you, well, you, you, you approve the Supreme Court when they do that. I understand what you just said. I, 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 the court has two choices, act like an originalist or not. 
If you're not going to act like an originalist, admit it. We could very easily live in a country, this, will, this, is going to send, this is going to scare a lot of people. We could have a Supreme Court of nine Judge Posners. We could. And all that would mean is a lot more honesty and a lot more transparency. That's what that would mean. A lot of the results would be the same, a lot of the results would be different, um, but I don't understand what you're saying about the last paragraph of my book. Either be serious about originalism and history, which the court is not, or admit that you're not doing that. Why, why is that controversial? Either do it or admit you're not doing it. Next round. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have David Upham, Mike Ramsey, and Randy Barnett. Uh, David. Um, yeah, the... Um, First point was already made that, that, that the language of Obergefell wrote say that this is what the history was. Now it could be that they were he was not telling the truth, and he knew he wasn't telling the truth about what they thought the liberty meant um, that the authors of the Fourteenth Amendment didn't know, and they entrusted future generations and specifically the five of the Supreme Court to tell us. It's possible he said that, and he actually meant it. I'll just bite my tongue before further say, saying further. Um, one of the things I have, and this is not peculiar to, to, to your work, but it's, it's something that troubles me a lot, is when either originalists or yourself will say, well, there are policy preferences, and then there's this thing called originalism. Um, I would really hope, as an originalist, that Supreme Court judges, one of their preferences is the policy called the rule of law, and one of their preferences is the rule of law interpreted according to its author's meaning. Um, a lot of the, I, I, I don't believe that all judges, uh, that the, all of the, uh, Scalia and Thomas have this kind of two-step, what are my policy preferences, what is originalism? I'll speak for myself autobiographically. I'm not a big fan of guns, but it's sitting there, smacking you right in the face. You got to deal with it. Um, I'm not a big fan of, the, I, I think Trinity Lutheran was wrongly decided. I'm, I'm a religious person, and, but I don't think that that's contrary to the 14th Amendment, those Blaine Amendments, because they were passed by the same people that passed the 14th Amendment. Um, I'm pretty sure I hate the policy, and I don't think it would require a great deal of virtue on my part, because I've got a policy that I tell the truth when I take an oath, you know, the judge, and I'm going to... Those are my policy preferences, too, and um, I don't know if the distinction between policy preferences and legal theory is, um, uh, is as distinct as is suggested, and many other people do this, um, re reducing, you know, one's opinions about right and wrong to a preference rather than a de determination of what's good for the common good. Um, lastly, about the, I mentioned this about the veils, um, and, and you brought up the transparency and honesty. In a nation, if nine judge posers are on the Supreme Court and keep talking like that, I would be terrified if uh, uh, an executive, say the, the chief executive officer of the United States, current or future, would read their opinions and think that they want to do the same sort of thing. There's good reason for people to hide things, partly because um, even if they're the noble, you know, noble guardians and they can break the rules in order to get justice done, I, I, I don't want the many, um, I don't want myself for that matter, to be given that kind of license. So even when the, I think there might be good reason why judges might actually you know, fudge things a bit, but, not, but, but act like Dudley Do-Rights, because Dudley Do-Rightism is an extremely good thing for a political community to have as a general rule of action. Um, yeah, well, Eric, thanks for this. And uh, I, I probably, as you know, I, I, I probably agree with a, a lot of things in this book more than some other people in this room, perhaps. And uh, in, in particular, I, I agree with at least a version of the, the realist critique of the Supreme Court. And I don't, I don't see that being in any sense inconsistent with, uh, with originalism. And, and I also agree that, it, that, um, that a strong deference um, uh, rule is, is at least a plausible uh, idea, both um, in terms terms of policy and also uh, worth exploring as a possibility of uh, what was incorporated within the original meanings. And I don't think that's inconsistent with, uh, with originalism either, or at least the idea of it isn't. It depends, that depends on the history. So, um, so I think there, there's a lot of things in here that, that originalists, originalists needn't get worked up about. Um, but let me focus on where I think uh, maybe uh, I disagree the most and where, where I think perhaps you're misreading modern originalism. And, and I think that it may come from uh, being somewhat distracted by um, what I would describe not um, in a negative way at all, but I, what I would describe as, as more controversial theories uh, of originalism, uh, controversial within originalism, 
uh, and uh, by the more difficult clauses of the Constitution. Um, and uh, what I think there is, though, leaving those things aside, I think that there is a core uh, of modern originalism that m most modern originalists agree with. And, and you said, taking my name, that, that I don't, my view doesn't have much in common with Randy's, and Randy's on the list next, so he can speak for himself, but my view is that my view has a lot in common um, with, with Randy's view, and, and that is that the core of originalism, which, which is that uh, the, the right way to do it, um, the right way to decide cases, the right way to resolve controversial con con constitutional controversies, um, is uh, to apply the text uh, taken with its context uh, to find its original meaning um, and to override the political branches um, when that seems a fair direction that's found in the original meaning uh, and the context. And, and this, this may have a, a few footnotes regarding uh, precedent and so forth, but, but leaving those aside, the, the core idea is um, that, that that's what originalism is about. At least that, that's the way I, I would sort of inarticulately describe it. And, and I think you're right that there is a faith there. Uh, and the faith is that that can be done some of the time. Not, not that it can be done all of the time, but that, that it could be some done some of the time. That can be done enough of the time that the project is, uh, is, is worth doing uh, in the sense that it can produce... Um, you know, answers not necessarily that are definitive, but answers that seem more likely than not. Um, and not, uh, Tom, that, that are the correct answers in, in, in the, some uh, um, moral sense or, or, or some policy sense, but, but simply are, are the best answers we can come up with um, as to the historical meaning. And, that, and that's all. Nothing, nothing more than that is, is claimed. And, and so, um, you know, Eric, I know you like to have specific examples, so um, I, I will give a specific example, which is the, uh, the recess appointments case. Um, and uh, um, I thought that in that case, um, that there was an originalist account that could be given uh, of what the, the controverted words meant. Uh, and, I was, uh, and, I, and I wrote a brief uh, in which I relied very heavily on the previous work of Mike Rapport, and, and I was very pleased that Randy uh, and, uh, and Mike and John and, and some other people, who were originalists, Chris, uh, joined that brief, um, and, and, I was, uh, and I was pleased that Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas uh, joined the opinion that adopted that uh, the view, and, and of course I was displeased that it did not receive five votes, uh, but... I don't really care that much about that because the project I don't think is necessarily um, to uh, to account for what the Supreme Court's doing, um, but rather is to to put forth a, an idea of of how originalism can answer constitutional questions. And so I think of that as being sort of the core. And I think th put that way, not. I'm sure some people will disagree with my view, uh, and, and which I said is derivative, really, of Mike Rapport's on, on a recess appointments, or a whole bunch of other things where I've actually done original work as opposed to just following what Rapport tells me to do. Um, but I don't think that disagree. I, I don't think that disproves it either. I, I, but I do think that there's there's a core of a methodology and 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 a core of results that are likely to to obtain among um, a, a cross section of originals in these kind of cases. And then I think once you move out from that, you, you get into a bunch of disputes. Um, you get into disputes of how to deal with, uh, with more open-ended or vague clauses, um, and you get into disputes into how, as to how to deal with um, uh, evolution of, uh, of, of our morality, of, of technology, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, and you get into disputes about what counts as originalism in on, on, on the outer areas. But I don't think that shouldn't distract you from the fact that I do think there's a core. Uh, and so I think that that's, I don't think, and I don't think that criticism undermines much of the book, but I think it's maybe a criticism that the book could take more of account of. Thank you. Um, well, Eric, um, I don't agree with anyth anything in your book, but that's not important right now. Um, I thought I would comment um, a bit about uh, the, my criticism of Justice Scalia, which you mentioned today and which you cite in your book. 
Um, and it was my Taft lecture that came out in 2006. I thought I'd say a little bit about that lecture, why, why I was critical, how I was critical. Um, in 2004, I argued the Raich case in front of the Supreme Court. In, in June of 2005, we got the results. And in those results, uh, we, we won the votes of Rehnquist, uh, Thomas, and, and O'Connor, and we lost the votes of Scalia, uh, Kennedy, and all the progressives as well. And I have to say that, um, and, and Justice Scalia was uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, respectful towards me during oral argument, but he was quite challenging uh, of me. And he made some moves that, in hindsight, were kind of shifty um, uh, in how he used precedent versus how I was arguing that Wickard, for example, was to be interpreted as precedent. But I was, I was a little disappointed in him. And I was disappointed in him not simply because of the result, but because I thought he'd let himself get played uh, by the Ninth Circuit, in particular by uh, Judge Stephen Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit. Because what Reinhardt, I think, uh, formulated was a strategy to get the Supreme Court to back off its Commerce Clause cases of Lopez and Morrison. It was a very crafty strategy. I mean, you'll, you know, we won below. We won below in a 2-1 panel split, a 2-1 panel in which the two liberals voted for us on Commerce Clause grounds, uh, Pragerson and Paez. Um, and uh, the conservative, the Reagan appointee, voted against us. Um, and I thought what had happened, um, and I, I think that what happened is that Reinhardt had developed a strategy of saying, okay, these conservatives, they like the Commerce Clause so much, we're going to give them Commerce Clause cases until they cry uncle. And it just so happened the first Commerce, and Pragerson followed Reinhardt's lead. I don't think Pragerson would have done what he did in the case if Reinhardt hadn't made that safe to do in another case that Reinhardt had done um, about uh, child porn. Um, and so he, Reinhardt, in a very, very lengthy opinion that you would think would have been authored by Justice Thomas, it was so originalist, uh, argued why a child porn that was just manufactured by one guy, it didn't go anywhere in Congress, et cetera, et cetera, that was protected, uh, that was beyond the power of Congress to reach. Um, uh, and then after he did that in the Ninth Circuit, Pragerson did what he did in the Ninth Circuit on our case. And I think the idea here was, okay, we got the first crack at the Supreme Court, but if they had ruled for us, next up would be child porn. After that was a self-assembled machine gun. That was coming. So all these cases were coming until the Supreme Court cried uncle. I saw all this coming. I, 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 was, I, I was a litigator. I, didn't, I, I had to explain how it is I got the votes of the two liberals and didn't get the vote of the conservative. Uh, I, 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 I knew this was happening in real time, and I made a bet. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I didn't necessarily put any money on it. I don't think I would have put any money. In fact, I'm sure I wouldn't have put money on it. But I was hoping, let's put it that way, that the conservatives on the court would see through this. And Justice Scalia himself would be canny enough to see through the fact that he was being played. And he'd stand up for principle. And he'd actually use this as an opportunity to stand up for principle. My, my, my uh, talking point in the media when I litigated the Rage case, and that is that federalism was not just for conservatives. See medical marijuana laws in California. That was my talking point. That's what I said to every reporter that interviewed me about it. And I wanted them to do that too. I wanted five justices on the Supreme Court to hold the line and prove to the country that federalism was not just for conservatives. It would have been an extremely important moment in our constitutional history if that had happened. And we got that. We got that from Rehnquist, of all people, and from O'Connor, and from Thomas. We did not get that from the hero of originalism, from the hero of, the, of conservatives, uh, the champion of conservatives, the lion-hearted champion of conservatives, Justice Nino Scalia. We didn't get that from him. And Kennedy, we got from Kennedy what we got from him, I think, because of personal reasons. Um, and, and, that, and I was disappointed. And I was invited to give the Taft lecture. And it just so happened Scalia had given the Taft lecture. And his Taft lecture was on faint-hearted originalism. So I thought this was a very nice opportunity and the people at Cincinnati would appreciate the fact that the subject of my Taft lecture was going to be Justice Scalia's Taft lecture because I had a few things to say about it. And what I had to say about it was that the methodology that Justice Scalia outlined in his Taft lecture, um, gave him, he gave himself five out, I mean I don't remember now specifically how many, but I think it's something like five different outs as to when he didn't want to follow original meaning, he didn't have to. And precedent was one of them, and really, really bad consequences was another, and he had, a, he had two or three more. And my position in that lecture was, if you give yourself five outs as to how you don't have to follow original meaning, then, you know, as a, as, you're really not an originalist. 
Um, and, that's, and so I wasn't criticizing him because of the results he reached in any particular case. You could be an originalist and reach results with which I disagree. I was challenging him because the theory that he gave, that he explained in his article, in his Taft lecture, uh, was not an original. It was, uh, it was what ultimately I said was not. I'm going to say a little bit about that in a second. But I said it was not an original. It turned out not to be original in theory, or in practice. Because in practice, this is how he did it. If he didn't like the originalist result, he decided based on po uh, post New Deal precedent that came out the other way. So that was what I said, and that's why I said it. And in particular, it's why I said it the way I did, which was pretty sharp. It was a sharply worded piece. It, this was my opportunity to vent, my only opportunity to vent, um, uh, after what I thought. Other than today. Other than today. <laughs> <laughs> this is my second opportunity. Right. Uh, so that was that. Now, uh, having said that now, that's what it was. Um, uh, I, would not say, I would not say it the same way today, in part because then I was using uh, a sectarian view of originalism. That is, if you didn't hold what I then perceived to be the correct version of originalism, then you were not technically an originalist because you were holding the wrong version of originalism and that made you not originalist and for the reasons I explained in my lecture. I don't hold that view. I don't, take, I don't approach originalism that way anymore and I haven't for some years. And this might explain the discontinuity between my attitude in 2006 and my attitude in 2016 and today. Uh, and that is I have more of an ecumenical view of originalism. I view originalism as a family of theories, as Larry Solom has said. It's why I think Mike and I are both have a lot in common, uh, even though we have differences in our views. And I, and, uh, I think all the people who have self-consciously called themselves originalists and have published that are originalists, even if I disagree with their version of originalism. And I now would say that I would say the same thing about Justice Scalia as well. There is something different about Justice Scalia and his relationship to original meaning than, with, than a non-originalist justice would have. Uh, and that is it has a presumptive weight um, I think not enough weight, um, and Justice Thomas gives it more weight. Uh, but that is why I would not call, I would, I would not, and I have not, um, for the last 10 years, said that Justice Scalia was not an originalist while he was still alive uh, uh, and, and now since he's passed away, for that reason. Because I hold a different view of how I label people with respect to originalism then as I, as, than I, I do now. Okay, thanks. Um, that's all very helpful. Uh, David, I, good reason to hide things. <sighs> Maybe. That was Neil Siegel's argument to me about my last book. Even if you're descriptively accurate, we shouldn't tell anybody. Um, I think the burden of proof is, is on you on that. I mean, I, I don't think there's a good reason to hide things. I would have been very happy had Justice Kennedy in his either Windsor or Obergefell or Lawrence or Romer case put a paragraph in there about why he thinks gays and lesbians are entitled to dignity. And a big part of that reason, I'm sure, is because of his mentor who he saw in the closet for 30 years suffer a lot of pain. And I think that paragraph would have helped that opinion, not hurt that opinion. I'm not saying he was dishonest. I'm just saying um, I don't think he... I, I, I think that's a big part of Justice Kennedy's mindset about gay rights, and I don't think the world would come down if he admitted it. Um, so that, so I don't, hiding things is not, there may be some moment in time when hiding things is good. Um, rule of law tells me you shouldn't do it. Um, I, you know, Jamal Green, of course, has written a lot about selling originalism, uh, Mike, and, um, and uh, I, think, I think he gets a lot of it right. I, I think there's something about Noel Can Canning that is unanswerable, which is, um, let's say you're, you and Mike are right about the original meaning, and I think you probably are. Um, you might be dead right. That doesn't tell a judge what to do, because we have 200 years or whatever it is of practice very inconsistent with that original meaning, and there will be, no, I, in my book I bracket this. I don't, one can be an originalist without a full-blown theory, or any theory, of precedent, because it's hard. And I, I had the same problem in my fantasy world. What would I do in my fantasy world? Which cases would I keep? Which cases would I not keep? But, but um, I don't see how an originalist goes about through originalist techniques. This is Jeff Powell talking. I'm talking, Jeff, Jeff Powell's talking through me now. Um, 
originalism cannot answer the question, what do we do with 150 years of practice inconsistent with the original meaning when we weigh all of the rule of law factors, reliance, and everything else? Um, uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't think no canning is, e is as easy as you think that it is. Um, Randy, all I'll say is um, your critique of Justice Scalia in that piece is consistent with Justice Scalia's jurisprudence before and after that piece. I think it is um, spot on. I have taken that and ran with it in any number of pieces, talking about, I mean, when Justice Scalia says in Prince, text doesn't answer the question, but <laughs> I think he, and then, and then spends a lot of time really doing history badly. That's a big clue as to what Justice Scalia was about. His refusal to even address any of the affirmative action arguments put forward by people in this room. Um, you know, so, so I think you're right about Scalia. I, then I want to make this one step that, that you're going to really you're gonna hate my book, you're going to hate this more. Since Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia voted the same way, n in these cases, 98 percent of the time, there are a couple differences on Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment cases, but they generally agree on every contested con law case without maybe five. He's not an originalist either. So when the President of the United States says, I want to appoint originalist judges like Thomas and Scalia, or like Scalia, um, I, guess, I guess I want originalists to stand up and say, wait a minute, do you really want another Scalia? <laughs> because he really wasn't an originalist. Um, so that's, that's what, I, what I think about that. Uh, if I could just briefly, I mean, I'm pressing. I mean, Caleb Nelson's stuff, uh, I think Stevens' dissent in McDonald kind of sets out the basic thing. You know, if you've got a, a, a reliance interest, uh, that means you've got a higher burden of proof. But, I mean, in, in Noel Canning, I mean, there's no investment in, uh, uh, in, in favor of the, the erroneous views. Just, just tell the president to stop doing it anymore. have been doing it for a long time, but just stop it. Uh, by, by the way, it just occurred to me, I, I do want to ask both of you guys, you don't think, when Justice Kennedy says that the original meaning of the, he doesn't say it in these words, but the 14th Amendment allows me to redefine liberty and every other generation to redefine liberty as we go on. That's what- Framers did that. I mean, he makes a historical claim. Right, I'm, I'm saying his, histor yeah. his historical claim is that we shouldn't use originalism to interpret the 14th Amendment, other than saying it's a general provision. That's the Blaisdell, Tom, you've written about this, but that's, that's Blaisdell as well. Blaisdell says, and I know Will says they got it wrong, um, Blaisdell says the contract clause is a general, not specific provision, so it can evolve over time. Once you say that it can evolve over time, I think we have to do some work to figure out what that means in the real world for originalism, because I guarantee you that's not what the Senate thinks, that's not what an informed president would think, that's not what lay people, lay people don't think that. Lay people, smart lay people, who read Supreme Court decisions don't think their rejection of originalism is originalist. That's not what they think, and I don't think it is either. Speaking of time, we have, uh, it's 5.40. Uh, we're scheduled to end at 5.45, but we started five minutes late, so with everyone's permission, why don't we go five minutes over uh, to 5.50? That gives us just 10 minutes now. Um, the Um, with, 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 uh, consent has been, has been granted a little reluctantly, but, um, so the final, I have a, a troika plus two of Stephen Sachs, Jeremy Tellman, and Don Drips, that's the troika, and then John Mikhail and Steve Smith. Uh, let's, uh, uh, so, um, uh, troika first, uh, Stephen Sachs. So once more onto the breach. Um, I think the uh, one analogy that might help for originalism as faith would be to analogize it to a particular faith. So let's say Christianity. There are lots of different kinds of Christianity. It may be hard to identify necessary and sufficient conditions for being a Christian. Um, it generally has something to do with wanting to follow the teachings of Jesus. Lots of people understand that in very different ways. You have everybody from, you know, the Pope to Joel Austin. And the... Um, you know, it's even plausible to, to say that Jefferson, the Jefferson Bible or, you know, moral the therapeutic deists who say that, you know, Jesus wanted each of us to find our own way and not to care too much about what society thought. So long as they start with Jesus wanted us, it's plausible to say that person's a Christian. Um, you know, it's also plausible for people within the tradition, as I'm not, to say, well, actually the correct understanding is much narrower than that, even though the genus is quite wide. 
And I think that's the dispute that you're seeing with all the varieties of originalism. It is plausible to say that this person is an originalist, even if they're saying the framers wanted us to define liberty in our own terms and not to adhere to that other thing. Because that in and of itself is a contentful requirement that you're doing because the framers said so. Um, and that you would have to provide other reasons for if they hadn't said so. I think with that in mind, it becomes a little bit easier to see what's going on in the universe of Supreme Court cases. So you note that um, you know, they don't seem to adhere to any particular theory. Part of that might be that a lot of them are using lots of different theories. They're using lots of different theories, not particularly well. Um, I think, though, that it's important to grapple with a lot of material, some of which you may do in other chapters. So, uh, you know, if you do, so for instance, Harry Edwards' work on the pitfalls of empirical legal studies, how it's very difficult to be sure that when you're looking at some other factor connected with judicial decision that you're not actually just tracking different judges, different opinions of the law. Um, secondly, the problem that when you're looking at contested cases, the universe of contested cases changes over time. We don't have original package cases anymore. Part of that is because of a general sense that the doctrine is wrong. Maybe that's incorrect. But if, you know, if you're only looking within the universe of contested cases, you've already set yourself up to look at things where legal reasons are going to have their least purchase in guiding the outcome. Third, you might have a problem of what, you know, sometimes called co conditioning on a collider. So if you look at the NBA, does being tall help you in the NBA? In fact, not all that much, because even short people in the NBA are still really, really good at basketball. Um, and the taller people are not the best people in the NBA. But that's because you don't get into the NBA until you've been determined to be really, really, really good at basketball, for which height helps you. Um, so the fact that there are sometimes short people in the NBA and that they don't seem much worse than the tall people doesn't tell you that height is unrelated to basketball performance. In the same way, it could well be that presidents and senates don't appoint Sandy Levinson. They don't appoint people whose policy views differ dramatically from their constitutional views. They only appoint people whose policy and constitutional views line up. So if you do the regression, you're going to see that everybody votes along with their policy views, and they keep saying that they're voting along with their legal views, but they may not be lying. Um, they may just, you, know, you may just be conditioning on a collider in that way. Um, finally, I think that it's, you know, with respect to originalism as faith, even if people are making these kinds of mistakes or sort of systematically erring and being guided by avoidance of cognitive dissonance in pursuit of their policy views, the, uh, the faith that's involved here may just be the sort of faith that's involved whenever anyone is expected to conform to some outside standard and might do it poorly. You know, we, we expect judges to do lots of things, but that's, what we expect of them may be different from what we expect from them. We may systematically expect that they're going to mess up a lot in, in systematic ways in the same way that we enact laws and also have prisons. Um, but that doesn't mean that the laws really don't mean anything. Um, and maybe there is a disconnect going on here. Uh, I, I know there is a disconnect because I'm, this book and my prior book is only interested in what the Supreme Court has done and then a normative question of what it ought to do in the future. And so I, I'm not, my pay grade, and I do other things in, in other times, but for this today and for those projects, that's my pay grade. And I don't think a reasonable person can describe the Supreme Court's behavior over the last 100 years in any sense as being originalist. Randy has said his views are prescriptive, not descriptive. You want the court to change, to become more originalist. Certainly Bork, Berger, and Grawley are all did their stuff to say the court should change. John and Mike say that they want the court to change to a different thing than it's been doing. So on, the, my, on my descriptive account of the Supreme Court, I am feeling very confident that it has not acted in a way that anyone would recognize as originalism over the last 100 years. Now, what are scholars doing? Well, that, that's a different question. And, I, and I'm, I'm only partially interested in that question. There are people who call themselves Christians who most people would agree aren't. There are people who call themselves Christians who may, or, or I mean, it's hypothetically possible for there to be somebody who calls themselves a Christian who the bulk, who most Christians wouldn't think are Christians. The question I'm asking in this book, which no one really has answered, um, is, is, is what is 
originalism. Um, and my view is whatever that answer is, it's not the Supreme Court of the United States, and I'm pretty sure it's not you guys. Um, it, it, it might very well be, be Randy and Jack, although I don't think so. <laughs> um, and so we need a different vocabulary to deal with this because Ilya Soman says that, um, you know, Obergefell is justifiable on originalist grounds. And that blows everybody away. And we need, and Calabresi does too, and we need new words to describe that phenomenon. Uh, that's right. I, and Thomas said this in, in a different way. Constraint is what it was all about originally. Now constraint is out the window. And we didn't change the label. So the label used to mean constraint. Now we don't care about constraint. And we use the same label. That's a puzzle to me. Uh, we are uh, at just about the, the end point. Uh, Pontius Pilate, I think, famously asked what was truth and then didn't stick around for an answer. Um, that is uh, utterly not the style of this uh, wonderful conference. So thanks to everyone. Um, and a uh, uh, round of applause for, for Eric and Chris. And on to dinner. <laughs> <laughs>